Good afternoon and welcome to another virtual edition of An Author's Afternoon. An Author's Afternoon is a space created by Prabha Khetan Foundation where book lovers get to rendezvous with some of the country's most celebrated English wordsmiths. The foundation on endeavors to address the cause of women through boutique events curated for life curated for like-minded literary enthusiasts across 30 cities in India and overseas. When the world plunged into the grimness brought about by the pandemic, the foundation geared up its efforts to ensure that patrons are not deprived of their passion for literature and reformat reformatted the sessions to go virtual promptly. Word lovers can now tune in to the various sessions from the sanctuary of their homes and interact with multifarious authors. Today we have with us celebrated author, media personality, and global leader, Hindol Sengupta, amongst us. Hindol Sengupta is a multiple award-winning author of nine books. He is the vice president and head of research at India's National Investment Promotion Agency, Invest India, under the Ministry of Commerce. He's the only Indian to have won the Wilbur Award given by the Religion Communicators Council of America for being Hindu in 2017. His latest book, The Man Who Saved India, Sardar Patel and His Idea of India, won the Valley of Words Award for the best nonfiction book of the year in 2019. The author is a World Economic Forum young global leader and a columnist for Aspen, Italy. He's been a senior journalist for the Indian editions of Fortune, CNBC, CNN, and Bloomberg TV, and is co-founder of Grin Media Network, which focuses on telling the civilizational story of India for the world. Sharing with us through the conversation today, we have another versatile personality, Aindrila Dutt. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the session. Thank you, Nalisha, and welcome, Hindol, and everyone else who's here with us today. The Iron Man of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, somebody who was rock-like in appearance and demeanor, a pragmatist who always dreamt of an integrated, independent, better India. He was often maligned as being anti-minorities, but never was so. One member of India's guiding political trinity, shedding light on a figure who is much misunderstood, sometimes forgotten, one of India's giants in the political arena, Sardar Patel, will be Hindal Sengupta. Hindal, let's start at the beginning. Why Sardar Patel? What attracted you to Sardar Patel as a subject of this book, The Man Who Saved India? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Inzila. Uh, by the way, you share your name with my sister. So I already feel very welcome uh, to this August gathering. Uh, I also feel very, very uh, welcome because I've heard so much about the Prabhakatan Foundation from many friends of mine, uh, people like Kirnutam Bosch, people like Tata Gota Chaudhuri, sometimes known as TC in Calcutta, and many others uh, in the field of arts uh, in India, in Calcutta. I grew up in Calcutta. I went to school in Calcutta. Uh, I was in, uh, you know, my seminal years growing up were all in, in Calcutta, but I haven't, I've been a Prabashi Bangali for 20 years. Uh, so I always treasure these opportunities in a sense. We still have a home in Calcutta and, uh, you know, of course I have lots of relatives in Calcutta and so on and so forth. So I always treasure these uh, uh, opportunities uh, to connect with Kolkata, with the people of Kolkata. And, uh, you know, I consider myself a son of Calcutta uh, uh, and, and it, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, e even though I had a bit of a really crazy day today, but I was insistent and determined that I would do this particular session because it comes from Kolkata. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I want to uh, take your question head on. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I want to take your question head on. Um, Sardar Patil is indeed a, a, a misunderstood figure in India. 
uh, or was misunderstood for a very long time. Um, you see, what happened after independence was uh, because of various reasons, and we may not have time to go into all the reasons. Uh, much of it is written in my book. Because of various reasons, the narrative, you know, all history or all historical events or historical personalities finally are a byproduct of the stories that are told about them, right? If the stories about them are not told in the right way, then uh, their importance either, you know, diminishes or if they're told right, then of course they rise, right? And uh, Sadar Patil, in my opinion, one of the problems with Sadar Patil's legacy is that if you look at the three people who really were at the forefront of the Congress party uh, when, it, when India got independent, Gandhi ji, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Pandit ji, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Sadar, Sadar Patel, uh, of the three people, Sadar is the only one who neglects to tell his own story or tell his own history, so to speak, right? Gandhi ji has left us yes. more than 100 volumes of his work, right? Uh, Pandit Nehru's work, again, is equally voluminous. Uh, there are volumes and volumes of his writings and works. And of course, his seminal books, The Discovery of India and others, right? A uh, prolific letter writer, yeah. prolific writer of history. Now, you may agree or disagree with him, but he definitely told us his story, right? As did Gandhiji. The only person among these three who did not tell us his story is Sadar Patel. And I write about this at length in my book. Yeah. That, uh, in fact, Maniban Patel, his daughter, even asked Sadar Patel, uh, why do, do you not write your own history, you know? And he says, well, Bapu, you know, writes his, the way he sees it. And uh, so does Panditji. Uh, why don't you tell us the story as you see it? Uh, but Sadar Patel famously says that, you know, some people write history that others created. And that's a great line. That's undoubtedly a great line. But in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that's a mistake. Because uh, in such a seminal event, uh, if such a seminal man does not care to tell his version of the story, then his version of the story would remain untold, which is what happened. Until, of course, some of us, you know, took the effort and took uh, the sort of, you know, determination to go through the archives, look at the material and write about him. So we have, apart from his letters, we don't have the story as Patel saw it, right? We only have his letters. Thankfully, his letters are quite sharp and illustrative. So we are able to draw much from those letters. But we don't have his perspective. And, and that's one of the problems of why Sudhar Patel has never been properly understood. But I do think now there is more and more interest in him. Also because I think uh, for a long time uh, in India, sovereignty was not very well understood. Uh, especially younger generations of India took India's geographical sovereignty as, as taken for granted. And I'm not sure how that happened. Because obviously throughout India's independent history, there's been troubles in Kashmir. There's been troubles in the Northeast. So how it developed among sort of the common Indians, people like you and me, this sense that sovereignty, the, the structure of India, the geographical structure of India could be taken for granted. I, I'm not sure how that happened, but that feeling definitely developed. And I think reading Sardar Patel really gives us a reality check to that feeling because we understand how hard won that sovereignty really is what it took to build that sovereignty, how difficult it was. And I think that is really not well understood even today. I mean, the people have finally started to understand it a little better, but for a long, long time through our 70 year independent history, we did not understand at a common, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, a few handful of historians, but I'm talking about, you know, common people at large did not value or did not understand how hard won this sovereignty of India really was what was paid to get the sovereignty for us. So we should never take it for granted. And I think that's really goes to the core of the Patel story. Uh, because remember, Patel was the man who actually stitched together what at that time was known as British India and princely India, right? Uh, more than 500 princely states. And of course, British rule India and brought them together to create what we you know, now know as the Union of India, right? So that's very important to remember and really goes again, as I was saying, to the core of the Patel story. Indraji, you're on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Indul, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Yeah. Okay. I was uh, going to ask you, he considered Gandhi his mentor and his guru. 
But it's not like he didn't have major differences with Gandhi. And he wasn't afraid to express his view. So why is it that he always kept sacrificing his own interests and himself on the altar of Gandhi's ambitions for Nehru? Is it because of that Eklavya Dronacharya analogy that you've drawn? Was it because he had a lighter sense of self? Or did he just keep uh, sacrificing his own uh, self-motivation? What, what is it that made him step back and not protest at unfair treatment? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, this Eklavya thing, of course, I mentioned in my book. Yeah. From, I, I quote directly from a speech. And it's that so relevant. It is very relevant. And, you know, it is straight from his mouth. And this is something that we have directly from Sadar's own mouth, right? This is from a speech that Sadar Patil gave. And it's very clear, you know, when he talks about, you know, Dronacharya, uh, Arjun and Ekalavya, it's very clear who these people are, you know, in his, his context, right? It's very clear yeah. that he's Ekalavya. Gandhiji, of course, is Dronacharya. And Jamalal Nehru, Nehru is... Right? Uh, there is no doubt about that. That's very, very clear. And, uh, and the question then to ask is, what is the th what is the equivalent of the thumb that uh, that yeah. Patel really gave up? And I would argue that it's probably the seat of the Prime Minister of India, right? Uh, the that, seat of the President of the Congress many times, Prime Minister of, of India many times, and finally, finally, when independence came, the seat of the Prime Minister of India. You know, in a sense, yeah. was the thumb that was you know paid yeah. by Patel as Guru Dakshina to his Guru, right? Um, so I also yeah. go into it in detail and I'll, I'll sort of, you know, try and encapsulate, you know, what is what is spread over many chapters in the book. Steve Patel um, lost his parents early, right? Uh, and he, because of the person he was, a stoic person, a person determined not to show any emotion in a sense, or mostly not show any emotion. You know, famously they said about Patel that uh, he got news of his wife's death you know, he was arguing a case in court as a barrister, very famous barrister, and the orderly, you know, or the peon, as we would call it today, brought in a little piece of paper, which, you know, brought in a telegram mentioning that his wife has died, had died. Patel took a moment to look at that telegram, folded it, put it in his pocket, finished his argument, and then went to the, you know, yes. to the right, right? So yes. that is the, you know, that in the sense is how stoic the man is, right? And because, mm. but remember, as with many stoic people, the vulnerabilities are, it's not like the vulnerabilities are not there. The vulnerabilities are only deeply hidden. They are covered. They are, you know, they, they, are, they are buried somewhere. And I think Patel's vulnerability came with Gandhi and Kasturba. Mm. Uh, because remember, if you compare his reaction to his wife's death, you, you think about Patel weeping uncon uh, uncontrollably at the feet of the body of Kasturba. Yeah. She was a mother figure for him. And, and what, a, what a contrast that is, right? Uh, we don't see much stoicism there. Mm. Right? The famous stoicism is not seen there. So in a sense, uh, Gandhi and Kasturba became in a sense a sort of paternal, maternal figures in his life, which he obviously had never had properly, right? And, and, and he also admired Gandhi for the higher moral ground that he occupied. Yeah. Absolutely. And he saw in Gandhi certain traits. You know, there's this part in my book where, I, where Patel says, he's the Mahatma, I am not. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. someone comes and tells him, oh, but you know, we have to do this exactly like this because Gandhiji said so. And he says, well, he's Gandhi, you know, he's the Mahatma, so you tell him that. I have to run a party. Right? I can't be like him. And that's a clear division because if Patel becomes like Gandhi, the party cannot be run. But uh, Hindu, I also want to ask you at this point that he had a very complex relationship also with Nehru. Yes. But there were ties of deep affection also. How did that pan out against the background of Gandhi's obviously favoring Nehru? How did that pan out? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting relationship. You know, today when we look at history, we always see this as simple binaries. But that's, of course, 
people like you and me and you know everybody listening to this understands history is really so such a clean binary you know there are very rarely such clean hero heroes and villains and rights and wrongs in history right these are complex things now it is true that um, you know the patel nehru relationship is a very complicated relationship and uh, in many cases nehru and patel disagreed very vehemently right um however please remember that for these men for most of their adult life especially for gandhi and uh, for especially for patel and nehru gandhi of course had you know a life in south africa and so on and so forth but especially for gandhi uh, for nehru and patel and others like him in their adult life they had barely known any other life but life in each other's company because they had very i mean look at the, all of their personal life nehru extreme mm-hmm. the personal life i mean you know of course his great you know a source of personal life is his father but after his father his life is also very tumultuous personal life is very tumultuous gandhi's own personal life extremely tumultuous tumultuous relationship yeah. with his wife tumultuous relationship with his uh, children and of course patel yeah. right losing his wife uh, you know difficult relationship with his children because really for them in that national movement their real family were they were their you know companions in that journey mm-hmm. they spent most of their time in each other's company whether in prison or outside prison these were their most valuable relationships their most valuable relationships were not with their wife or brother or sister father they were with the co travelers in the national movement right and no matter how much the diet tribe and the and the and the discomfort between nehru and patel and there was a lot of that so much so that you know months after the first government of india is created both patel and nehru are saying we should resign because we can't work together and that's in my book yeah. however having said that it cannot be denied that because they had spent so much time in each other's company because they had spent so much of their critical moments their worst moments they in jail in despair all kinds of things in each other's company they really uh, you know it's it it's very difficult for them to completely erase one another from each other's life right so it's uh, in that sense in it's the, in that sense no matter how difficult the situation and no matter how much the bad blood they are somewhere joint and the hip intertwined with one another because in a sense their yeah. destiny to the national movement has intertwined them together okay uh, hindu you uh, touched upon the princely states now that is a huge contribution of patel's he yes. delivered the princely states to india and he secured kashmir for india and uh, you know when you think in hindsight of all that he did all that he said uh bulgan in in fact commented you've written about it that yes. how did you liquidate the princely states without liquidating the princes yes and a lot of his advice would have stood us in really good stead where kashmir is concerned if we hadn't gone to the un if we had taken that little bit of time to push them back their problems facing us even today so i think people would be really interested to hear your views on these well kashmir for sure yes absolutely. there are wonderful interesting stories about the princes but it can fill a book yes no no absolutely and uh, some of them of course are in the, in this book too and uh, yes absolutely i spent of course a large part of the second half of the book or the last and third of the book talking essentially about kashmir about hyderabad uh, about yes. junagar uh, and about you know issues like china uh northeast of india the building of the somnath temple and so on and so forth right um kashmir is very interesting um clearly patel and nehru differed on what to do with kashmir and there in kashmir they even found their sort of you know each supported one person you know patel was closer to maharaja hari singh whereas yeah. nehru was always close to sheikh abdullah right yes. Yes. and they, they they have taken sides right from the beginning you know you can see it from the letters that patel and nehru mm-hmm. writing about the kashmir yeah. they very and you written about it at like absolutely and they clearly differ right and it is to be remembered 
that actually Kashmir may have and Srinagar may have not been today part of India had it not been for Patel's decision to send in uh, the, in, in the Indian Air Force at the right time to, the, to yes. save the Srinagar airport. Yes. Uh, it must be remembered that uh, when the instrument of accession was brought back from Kashmir uh, and landed yes. in Delhi's old Sadarjang airport, the man standing there to receive that instrument of accession is Vallabhai Patel. And yes. there are interesting parallels there because uh, if, if that is one iconic airport scene. The other iconic airport scene, of course, is after Operation Polo in Hyderabad. It is Patel who flies into Hyderabad and the Nizam who probably never budged out of, you know, uh, 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 out yeah. of palace, you know, barring maybe for God Almighty. The Nizam goes to Begumpet to receive him. To receive Sadar Patel. And there is this, yeah. there is this wonderful image this photograph of both of them together. Um, and, and, you know, so it is Patil, and it, it shouldn't be forgotten, Oindrida, that when all of this is happening in the, in, in 1940, you know, 46, 47, 48, you know, and into 50, Patil is a very, very ill dying man. You know, his body has entirely broken down. He can barely eat anything. He cannot sleep. Uh, he has to physically, uh, you know, walking is difficult for him. Uh, but he's crisscrossing the length and breadth of the country in extremely uh, basic aircrafts and, you know, basic transportation to make this happen, right? Uh, so Kashmir, yes. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, we would not have been able to save Srinagar had it not been for that decision of Sadar Patel to fly in uh, the Air Force. Also, uh, long before this came to this, you know, this the first battle, so to speak, Sadar Patel had ordered the laying of transmission lines. You know, how did India, how did Delhi get information yeah. that the Pashtuns were coming down from their yeah. mountains towards Srinagar? Because of these telegraph lines, yeah. because of these communication roads and lines that Patel constructed, uh, you know, right after independence, right? Or got them constructed at record time. Yeah. Right? Uh, on China, again, you know, when Mao sent in his army, uh, to take over Tibet in early 1950. Uh, it was Patel who yeah, wrote an yeah. extremely illustrative letter, Oindrila, as I mentioned in my, uh, in, in my book, uh, that where he clearly says that we worry a lot about imperialism from the West, and rightfully so, but we don't worry enough about communist imperialism. And he says, in my mind, there is no difference. Imperialism is imperialism. One person in fact, he warned repeatedly about China. Uh, Nehru's Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, the fact that Nehru sponsored China at uh, the UN and pushed their cause. And really, in hindsight, if you look at it, when Mountbatten said that Patel has his feet on the ground, Nehru has his feet in the clouds, it, it was also a difference of background. You know, uh, urban versus rural, urbane versus rustic, uh, global, globalistic versus ethnic Indian. But when you judge what Patel advised, especially in the context of Pakistan, in the context of China, which is so relevant today, a lot of problems we might have been able to circumnavigate or avoid altogether if we had taken his advice. So China, I think, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And in, in China, you know, uh, there is so much about China that Patel, uh, Patel, in, uh, you know, sort of legacy we have ignored. Uh, you know, even after writing the book, I recently unearthed, I was writing this big essay on China and Patel uh, on this new platform that I founded on foreign policy called New World Order, uh, New World Order dot today for anybody who wants to go and see it. Um, so I was writing this essay on China uh, on the platform and Patel. And I discovered a letter from Patel, again to Nehru, where uh, Nehru is complaining that, well, you know, uh, we keep thinking of all these people, you know, some of the Chinese diplomats and stuff as spies, and they're not really spies, you know, we are necessarily closing our mind and this, that, and the other. And Patel actually says that, you know, he writes to him saying that if you, uh, when all evidence from the, from the IB and all the sort of, you know, 
secret service agencies have been placed and the police have been placed and a decision yeah. being taken for you to step in because remember he's home minister so he's say telling nehru for you to step in at the last moment and uh, you know supersede their decision means that tomorrow they will not have the confidence to take the right decision yeah. so you should not do this and and warned sir nehru about ambassador being taken for a ride absolutely. in fact and you know and that's that's that and that's well known i mean you know patel famously says that our ambassador to china constantly sounds like china the chinese ambassador to india <laughs> yeah right yeah. and and you know and and there's a letter that nehru writes to him where he says well you know there was this chinese schoolmaster and uh, you know i always thought that he was a nice guy but all these Head evidence in the cloud to me that you know he was a spy and so on and so forth and then nehru in a classic nehruvian sense writes you know the chinese ambassador came and even wept tears before me saying don't throw him out but we still did it it was so unfair and one one i mean when you know in 2020 reading that letter one is astounded at the naivete uh, at, at what is being suggested it's eerie yeah you know and and it is incredible that you know what kind of naivete is you know and it's eerie as you correctly say uh, and what is being yeah. suggested um so you know this with these problems and whether to to take you know it was patel who said very clearly that remember the decision to take kashmir to the united nations or what was at that time called uno united nations organization um yeah. was taken when patel was actually traveling and mm. it was not patel it was not patel it was not taken into confidence when that decision was taken and patel later said in many uh, you know speeches that we have actually gained nothing by taking this to the un we've been taken we for still don't have closure exactly we, we still, still don't have any closure and 70 years later his his words echo around us you know because and ricochet yeah. around us and around our policy making because lo behold he's he was right you know and we have got nothing through that process we have not been able to close the issue the issue is still alive with us and and that's the problem right i mean you know uh, article 370 you know patel never wanted article 370 he talked about that right i mean you know and and, we, and there is clear evidence to suggest that you know uh, patel's actually secretary writes very clearly shankar writes that when article 370 was drafted patel was not consulted yeah. it was done by shankar and nehru right and it was in fact then nehru went started to travel and left uh, you know article 370 to be cleared by the you know by, by the congressman so to speak by the party uh, to patel and patel has not been in his speech but he was never taken into confidence for article 370 yeah. Yeah. so again and again if you look at the you know the book and the incidents for anybody who reads it with a clear mind there is no doubt that there was a lot of deep affection between these men and yeah. very ties between them but while we say that we should not also deny the deep and conflicts between them because i think the distrust justice between yeah. injustice because even yeah. if you say today that oh they were always enemies that's injustice but to suggest yeah. that there was no conflict between them and these very deep conflicts and chasms didn't occur or did not exist would also be lying and and would be we would be doing great injustice to the history of india if we said sure. that so sure. so i think we should okay. take a balanced view yeah hindol i'm going to move very quickly there's so much to cover uh, yeah. you know there's this narrative about patel being anti minorities and a yeah. right wing person yeah. and yet this man always called for integration always called for no class divides or religious divides he wanted indians to be known as indians and he did not consider himself part of any wing so why is this erroneous uh, view still persisting about patel well i think what has happened basically was and this is again in my book in great detail you know there's a whole portion where both nehru both uh, sorry both gandhi and patel are saying you know what is this right wing i mean we don't even understand what this right wing yeah. is you know we are just fighting for independence so we have no idea what this right wing business means see basically what happened was the congress was a national movement right but once communism came into play the congress uh, because it was a great umbrella movement 
developed a very strong left wing and in classic way the moment there was a left wing the other had to be called something so therefore it was a right wing and patel never accepted this yeah. uh, label he didn't really understand where this label came from and he certainly had nothing to do with it i mean in fact if at all there were others like madan mohan malviya and so on and so forth who were the you know sort of the more conservative uh, factions of the congress yeah. right in fact yeah. people like patel or rajendra prasad or 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 uh, mahatma gandhi himself were very much the centrists of the congress right and i would say that you know uh, nehru too was a to a degree a centrist but he definitely had very strong sympathies towards socialism and that's i mean he called himself a socialist i mean there's no there's no dispute about that i mean he, we we find all of that in his own writings he's a self declared socialist uh, which is fine and he got that from his years in cambridge um, but but as far as patel was concerned this is a misconception and over the years of course you know because of various political reasons these things have been drummed up but uh, if we go to the primary source we find that patel uh, never accepted any of these labels uh, though jinnah and he hated each other but jinnah of course defended him in court when he got arrested ironies of politics but patel was one of the first leaders to recognize the need for partition because yeah. he had yeah. to save the larger blood bath Right. now similarly and this is a point interest here he did not get on at all with a very feisty socialist called subhash chandra bose exactly yes he had completely differing views exactly. this is a very pragmatic man who like gandhi supported indian business and business people uh, obviously netaji didn't so very quickly a few reasons for the differences between the men yeah i mean i think there was one primary difference between uh, the viewpoints of sardar patel and uh, uh, netaji subhash chandra bose and that was basically see netaji wanted armed rebellion and once yeah. gandhi came into the picture in the national movement patel hitched his bandwagon to gandhi ji and as his guru his argument was gandhi ji's path is non violent we cannot accept anybody who advocates violence also as an answer and netaji he, he didn't believe in unqualified non violence himself absolutely okay. he was very clear that well the kind of violence that netaji was propagating as an option would not be acceptable and i think yeah. also when netaji beat gandhi's uh, you know uh, candidate for presidentship of the congress party the rift only became larger and i think there was perhaps there was an, a feeling somewhere that a, that netaji would take the congress down a very different path compared to gandhi ji right and yes. patel was very clear that the congress and the national movement had to primarily follow gandhi ji's path anything else was fringe but it could mm -hmm. not be fringe if the president of the congress party was advocating those means right and that divide and i think uh, you know both uh, netaji subhash chandra bose and his older brother sharod bose right uh, they actually yes. felt yes. Uh, extremely hurt uh, when when you know netaji finally left uh, the presidency of the congress party yes. and they blamed patel for it and they said you know patel is to blame for it and as the party boss he had you know in a sense turned the party against the party president Uh, under the sort of advice of of Mahatma Gandhi and wrote to Mahatma Gandhi complaining about it which is probably a little inappropriate also it was yeah, Gandhi all the way yeah exactly but i mean you know those were the times and you know this was the battle and so on and so yeah. forth yeah. and i think there was further rift because when uh, sardar patel's older brother died uh, he left oh, his older brother was a great friend of of netaji subhash chandra bose and uh, you know vithal bhai patel and when vithal bhai died he left his inheritance in a sense to subhash chandra bose to subhash chandra bose and the there was a court case there was court battle which sort of you know finally resulted in patel one so yeah so that this was a deep rift no doubt yeah yeah okay um you know uh, i just want to touch on that most important point once more yes. time and again gandhi ji it was inexplicable his choices his actions time and again he chose uh, nehru over sardar patel 
And there are a lot of reasons for why he didn't make him the first PM. But as you mentioned in your book, book there are a lot of counter arguments to those reasons. So would you like to dwell on some of them? You know, the westernized attitude of Nehru, who would be able to deal better with world politics and politicians, etc. So I think it all began basically by Gandhiji realizing early in his career in the Congress that he wanted the support of the Nehru family. Because remember, Motilal Nehru was one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest barrister of India at that time. So, so opulent was Anand Bhavan in Allahabad that uh, when the prince came visiting, one of the places that was offered to him for him to stay was Anand Bhavan, you know, I mean, that was the opulence of the Nehru's and, uh, and he refused and he refused and you know and and see the thing is um, I think Gandhiji realized that he would require the support of Motilal Nehru so even when Motilal Nehru writes after the Bardoni Satyagraha that the natural next claimant to the presidentship of the Congress is Sadar Patel yeah. Gandhiji sort of you know bypasses that and says well if not Mo Jawaharlal then you know put Motilal there because Motilal yeah. writes saying, if not Patel, make Jawaharlal the president. Yeah. And then Gandhiji finds a middle path and says, you know, let's turn the tables and make Motilal the, uh, the president. So it all, I think, began from there. And I also think that um, Gandhiji realized that Patel was, I mean, Patel was too independent minded. You know, Nehru, in a sense, was more sort of almost like a child, in a sense, at least in ancient years. Of, of Gandhi, right? I mean, Patel, in a sense, was more of Gandhi's equal, right? Mm -hmm. Nehru was really a true heir in many ways. And I think uh, Gandhiji also thought that, you know, in a post-British um, world, uh, Nehru, who called himself the last Englishman to rule India, and this is, you know, Nehru himself said this, uh, famously, uh, you know, would be able to conduct uh, world affairs in a particular manner. But yeah. I question all those things. And also Patel was older and was unwell. But in my book, I question all of those things because remember, apart from Gandhi and Nehru, the only other person who, you know, uh, had their face on the cover of the Time magazine was Vallabhai yes. Patel. In Jan 1947. And, 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 and so, said that this is the face of uh, India, the cohesive force of India, a correct. free India, which is terrific. Correct. And you so, know, and, and so much for, uh, you know, the argument that the world did not recognize Patel. You know, clearly that was not very true, right? And, and I also make the argument that, well, if he was so unwell, then how is it that he was crisscrossing through the country and switching the country together, right? I mean, you know, if he was unfit to be prime minister uh, because of illness, how was he fit to do this? Because surely this was even more taxing, right? Um, so therefore, I questioned some of these ideas, but yeah. it was very clear that Gandhiji wanted uh, Nehru to be his heir. And also Gandhiji realized, that I, I, I mentioned this in my book, that Nehru would not have accepted Patel as prime minister. Yes. And that would have probably split the Congress party. And yet his decisions, for example, Gandhi himself didn't want India to have an army after independence. And immediately... Pakistan attacked, we had that war. So That's where right. exactly would we have been without that? Oh, I, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know also, uh, let me say this, um, about the Indian civil service, you know, there was an argument to disband the really ICS, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. The Indian yeah. civil service. But it was Patel who said, no, if we disband this in a country yeah. divided by regional strife, language strife, religious strife, you know, ethnicity, yeah. all kinds of things, you need a trained band of people who would rise above this, you know, who would be posted far beyond their natural sort of e ecosystem. And they would have to be the objective quote unquote steel frame. Otherwise India could not be administered. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Each region would only want their own people, right? Yes. And yes. each subgroup and whatever, you know, caste and creed and all kinds of things. So it was Patel who ensured, and that's why even today, you know, uh, all young uh, civil servants are are trained at the, uh, at, you know, uh, I, 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 there's a new, uh, you know, rule that they all have to go and, and you know, in a sense, study at the feet of the Patel statue, which I thought, you know, I went to give a lecture there, uh, um, to, to give a lecture on Patel at the statue. And I was very pleased to see all these sort of, you know, young civil servants being, you know, taught this. And Lavasna, for instance, you know, at Masudi, which is the center, which, uh, 
uh, we yes. train young civil servants. They teach a lot about Patel. You know, I've written extensively in their journals and for papers on Patel and so on and so forth. They extensively teach Patel as statecraft. You know, his ideas as statecraft. Right, on how to administer, how to govern, and how to run a country. Right? Uh, so these are again very, very valuable contributions which uh, we really we neglect at our own peril. Okay, Hindu, one last question before we uh, hand over to Nilisha yeah. for question answers from the audience. Yes. You know, it's tantalizing to imagine the face and shape of India if Patel had been alive for a few years more, working in tandem with Nehru, putting his foot down where necessary, and how different would we have been? I'd yeah, like I'm you to just sure. visit that briefly. Yeah, I'm quite sure. And, you know, as a historian, um, you know, I'm, I'm always um, a, a little skeptical in, uh, in, in talking about, you know, what could have been could history. Have been. You know, because, I mean, that's not really history, as you know, and as all of no, us do. But it's tantalizing to think about it. But it's very tantalizing to think about it, I, you know, uh, but it's not real history, but very tantalizing to think about nonetheless. Uh, well, I may I hazard a guess and say, uh, I certainly feel that we would have solved Kashmir much earlier. Mm -hmm. We definitely would have solved, because look, I mean, as you know, the constitution was very clear that Article 370 was under temporary provision, right? Everybody knows this yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. It was very clearly under temporary provisions for 10 years, right? And uh, Patel, if had he, had he lived for a few more years, would have wanted to conclude this in five years. He would have figured out something, struck a deal, and solved it. You know, I mean, already uh, Patel was uh, suggesting things like, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that uh, Kashmir doesn't become a, a, a mono sectarian place, for instance, and so on. And, and, you know, Patil would have figured out a deal, you know, with the young nation of Pakistan, uh, Patil would have struck a deal and resolved the issue. It would have involved some give and take, but in classic Patelian manner, they would have struck a deal and solved this. So that's number one. Number two, I think Patel would have been far more wary about China. Yeah. And you know? uh, he had a very fine sense about yeah. what was happening, because if you remember, he said first, that China, uh, uh, Pakistan needs to worry about the enemies within the country. Yeah, that, and that has come true. Exactly. Absolutely. That was prescient, absolutely. Extremely prescient. Okay. I so think I, we China, have to... I just want to make one point before we go to Q&A. Yeah, yeah, sure. So two things Patel, I think, would have done. He would have definitely resolved the Pakistan question, and he would have resolved the border issue with China. Yeah. Because remember, uh, you know, until the 1960s and well into the 70s, it was far, at least the 60s, I mean, definitely before the war, there was far more room to negotiate and resolve the Chinese border issue. So I cannot imagine that a man like Patel would have not immediately I'm gone sorry. towards that and resolved it. So essentially, all our border sovereignty issues would have got resolved, which means we wouldn't have all these wars. We would not have yeah. so much, you know, bloodshed. You know, I mean, it's 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 tantalizing to imagine because look at the price we have paid for this. Yes, absolutely. You know, of, you know bloodshed of money of all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, uh, that was Hindus and Gupta shedding part light on the Iron Man of India, Sardar Patel, a man who was passionately that didn't come up today, but passionately opposed to untouchability. Oh, he yes. believed in the importance of basic education, Absolutely. not just what Nehru believed in, uh, really excellent quality in higher education facilities. It had to work in tandem. This is a man who really believed in the right of India to survive and progress with dignity. He spent his life trying to work towards that. So thank you so much. Make one point, you know, I yeah. think it's where I'm mentioning. The minority rights that we have today in embedded and enshrined in our constitution. Yes. Let's not forget who was the leading light of the committee that brought about those minority rights. It yes. was Sadar Vallabhai Patel. It is. He was the leading light of that committee that enshrined those minority rights in our country. Yeah. So thank you very much.
Prabha Kayatan Foundation for this afternoon. It really enriched me to read about Sardar Patel. And just one word about our heritage, tangible and intangible. A large part of it is through our personalities, our historical giants. And what Hindul has done is uncover one such, not very well known, misunderstood, very often forgotten. So over to you, Nilisha, and thanks so much, Hindul, for making this so good. Thank you very much. Nilisha. Thank you, Angela and Hindul. And I'm sure such a short duration can never do justice on such a big topic, especially when two of you are so much. We have a question from Monica Sen. Uh, Ma'am, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, I just wonder that this enormous statue that has been made of uh, Sadar Patel, what would he have viewed it as? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think Sadar Patel fundamentally would not have liked statues because he was a yeah. self-effacing man. He did not, uh, you know, he did not even write, like I said, history from his point of view. So he would not have, uh, you know, liked large statues of himself. However, let me also add that statues are not built for the people whose statues they, they are, if you know what I mean, right? They are built for other generations to remember. And I sometimes, I'm actually torn yeah. about this. I sometimes feel that, yes, it is true that Sadar Patel may have, or indeed would, would not have liked a huge statue of himself. But because he did not write his own history, I think whether a statue, whether something else, and I as a historian would obviously prefer books to a statue, uh, but it is important for new generations to remember the price that was paid for the sovereignty of this country. So as a historian, I would say, let's have more books. Let's put it more in our curricula. Let's teach it in our schools and so on and so forth. Yeah. Clearly, uh, at the, at the, the incumbent government has chosen the path of a statue. But, uh, but uh, overarchingly, I would say, you know, moving away from just the statue, I would say it's important for younger generation because it's very easy. And, you know, a lot of people have forgotten how this country, even its geography, the shape that we imagine every day, how it was brought together. That's important to remember. So, you know, as a historian, I would say, you know, that's okay, fine. Let's not have a statue, but let's have more history books about it, you know, and exactly. let's do more exactly. archival research and let's put it in our curriculum and let's teach it better and let's, you know, maybe do a great movie about it and things like that. Thank you. Thank you for your question, ma'am. Do we have any more questions? Okay, we have a question from Sakshi. Uh, I'll just read it out, Hindul. Yeah. Very... I can see it. But, uh, oh, so... understand, understand. Yeah, go on, go on, please. While writing and researching so intricately, you may have come across personal or confidential details, habits or stories about Patel that were unheard of, astounding or shocking to learn. Would you please like to share any of those moments you witnessed that with us? You know, I like how everything is like these days, everything has become, you know, slightly republicized, you know, like everybody wants a little bit of like, you know, out of Goswami Masala somewhere or the other, you know, like, okay, what are the salacious details? Well, I'm sad to say there aren't very many salacious details like that about Patel's life. The man was a very private man, a very stoic man, uh, you know, really, really spent all his life and time and effort and money and whatever he could to fight for India's freedom. I mean, there was not much else in his life. Uh, his wife died very early. He never married again. Uh, he communicated with his own children largely through letters and, and you know, uh, you know, a, a very strong man. But a couple of things uh, which might be of historical interest, let me put it, and not so much about his personal life, but, you know, interesting nuggets of history, if I may, uh, if I may be allowed. Uh, one thing is that, please remember, the Somnath Temple would have not, never got built with, had it not been for Sadar Patel. It was Sadar yes. Patel after Junagar was uh, merged into India, the basic state of Junagar. Patel went there uh, and saw the dilapidated state of the Somnath Temple and told K. M. Munshi, the great Gujarati literature, lawyer, you know, um, writer, that, look, we really need to rebuild this. 
and uh, why don't you, you know, take the lead on this? And actually, Munshi, you know, what began when Patel was still alive, came Munshi finally uh, was able to really build the build the Somnath Temple as Patel had requested him to after his death, in spite of a lot of, uh, you know, like resistance from the from the incumbent prime minister from Nehru, the Somnath Temple still could get built. So that's one interesting thing. And another thing that I mention um, in my book right at the end, many of you would have heard the name Vargi Skurian, you know, very famous as yeah. the man yeah. who really gave us Amul, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. celebrated in the great and so on and so forth. You know, so Vargi Skurian, uh, the great uh, dairy legend and uh, cooperative movement giant, he knew Maniban Patel very well. And, um, you know, he... He was very, uh, so he knew Maniban Patel very well. And he said two things which are very interesting. Uh, one was that, you know, he said about Sadar Patel, that Maniban Patel said that I could never really uh, show my emotion to my father at all. Mm. Because my father was not a man who sort of, you know, really understood emotional outbursts and so on and so forth. And we find this in his letters also. You know, he's forever writing to Maniban saying, you know, you suddenly go quiet, then you suddenly start crying if I say something to you. Like, what's going on with you? So I think that sort of personal emotional depth, Mani Ban definitely lacked from her father. And I think that was, in a sense, it was a, a wound in her life. The second thing was that Mani Ban also said that after Patil's death, remember Patil was the main treasurer of the Congress party. So, and at that time, people used to give cash to the party. You know, at that time, there was, it wasn't so common for people to write checks or whatever. So they used to give large volumes of cash. So about 20 or 30 lakh rupees was, uh, you know, was kept in a safe um, with Patel, which was party funds. And after Patel's death, Maniva and Patel actually went to meet the prime minister to return this money. Because, you know, she said that this is, you know, my father would have liked me to return this. This is not our money. This is the party's money. Please take the money. And she told Vargi Skurian that the Prime Minister didn't ask her for once yeah, on how she was doing because she really didn't have anything. You know, how she, her whole soul, you know, center of her life was her father. The moment her father died, she really had nothing else, right? So that was an interesting thing that I discovered during the research of this book. Thank you for the question. Uh, do we have any more questions? Excuse me. Mm, Lilisha, there's no uh, no more questions. I think nobody. Okay. Uh, there are no more questions, and but then there are a lot of thank yous that are coming in on, on chat, and I would also like to take this opportunity. Okay, we do have a short question. Any other book after this? Yeah. <laughs> yes, many other books after this. Uh, <laughs> I've been, you know, I, I was away for a few years. Uh, I was away at uh, you know Columbia and then at Oxford, so I haven't had time to write the book project that I have in mind, but a whole bunch of things coming up. Uh, I have just finished writing a book, which is called the truth about neighbors. And I hope, you know, there's nothing, no trouble breaks out and jettisons that book because that's actually written with a Pakistani co-author, mm. basically an Indian and a Pakistani writing about the same things through two different perspectives. So each is one you know, topic that we pick up and we write from the Indian perspective and the Pakistani perspective side by side in one book, right? Uh, we're just always worried that, you know, who knows, some troubles might break up. And then, of course, you know, there would be, uh, you know, it will jettison our book. But that's one thing. Uh, I'm also the biographer of Shami Vivekanando. Many of you might know The Modern Monk is the book that I wrote on him. Uh, so I also want to write a book on uh, Ramakrishna Paramhan, his guru, um, you know, and uh, that is of great interest to me. At the moment, I'm also writing um, or trying to write a book on the Ashtavakra Gita. Many of you might know the Bhagavad Gita, but I have been fascinated by the Ashtavakra Gita, which is also a great text of, uh, of Advaita Vedanta. So I'm very interested in that. And then I also have a sweeping history of, you know, like there's, there's been lots and lots of research work, archival work and books written about Hindu politics not Hindu, sorry, Christian politics or Islamic politics, right? Politics in the name of Christianity or politics in the name of Islam around the world in different countries and so on and so forth. From the Ottoman Empire to, you know, the, this, that and the other. I am trying to write a sweeping history from uh, right from the Vijayanagara kingdom uh, right up till present day of politics in the name of Hinduism, right? 
in some shape or form. And it would be this sweeping, you know, many centuries uh, book, you know, so it goes through, you know, the Vijayanagara kingdom, it goes through Shivaji Rao Bosle, it goes through, of course, the Marathas and, you know, uh, then, you know, travels all the way down to, you know, present day. Uh, everything, like, you know, the whole, all, all the sort of, you know, different aspects of, uh, of politics in the name, in a sense of Hinduism uh, from the 15th century to today. So, but that is a bigger project. It'll take some time. So these are some of the things that I'm looking at at the moment. Wow, these are really, really interesting. Thank you, Sona Kapoor, for this question. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Mr. Hindol Sen Gupta and Oenjula Dutt for such an intriguing and inspiring session. We all mm -hmm. learned and understood various facets of Sardar Patel. And I'm sure there's lots that's still left to uncover and we should all read your book to know more. I thank She Cement Limited, Taj Bengal and PK. Uh, Prabha Ketan Foundation for arranging such an enriching session for us, even in such trying times. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>